This conference will now be recorded. Sir, can we start, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, whenever you say, sir, no issues. Sir, uh, yeah. physically, students are uh, seated in the seminar hall. Okay. Uh, they are uh, they are not joined this uh, online uh, platform. Okay, all right, sir. No issues. Yes. In one seminar hall, we display that uh, screen, and uh, that students oh. are attending that particular lecture. All right, all right, right. Uh, we can we start, sir? Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. Shall I? Is the just, screen visible? Just I also? introduce. Just I introduce you. Okay. And then we will. Okay. Yeah. Please, please sir. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, today with us, Dr. P. S. Suvin sir from NIT Suratkal. Uh, he will discuss on topic an overview on lubrication and lubricants. I welcome him on behalf of Mechanical Engineering Department. Before start this session, I give brief introduction about him. He completed his M. Tech from NIT Calicut. He got his PhD in Tribology and Manufacturing from IISC Bangalore. He has worked in Department of Power Mechanical Engineering of National Formara University, Taiwan. He published a number of papers in international journals and conferences. He got a MA Communication Medal for Best Academic Performance in IIC Bangalore. Also, he got Best Paper Award in Tribology Online Journal in JEST Japan 2019. He got first prize in Idea Conclave Bangalore, SFD India in October 2017. His area of interest are sustainable manufacturing, traditional and non-traditional machining, tribology, and green lubricants. With this brief introduction, I request Suvin sir to start his session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for the kind introduction. Uh, sir, okay. may I know the time till time? What time I have to speak? Like, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, twelve fifteen. There is a another lecture by Doctor Sahu oh. sir. Right. Uh, so right. and uh, so one and a half hour I will take. Yeah. Uh, from eleven thirty, there is a uh, re recession break. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so let can, me please. Uh, one and a half correct, hour sir. we can take. Sir. Sure, sir. Please, yeah. So. Please feel uh, free to uh, interrupt, sir. Okay, if anything is there. Okay. Yeah. Ha. Uh, screen is visible, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, welcome everyone. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank Professor for introducing me. And also, I would thank uh, uh, Sharad Institute of Technology, College of Engineering, uh, for giving this opportunity to share my uh, little knowledge. So, uh, uh, very welcome as well as a happy new year to everyone have a safe uh, uh, prosperous and happy new year 2022 so the topic i am going to cover here is an overview on lubricants and lubrication so the objective of this talk is twofold as you can see i will be speaking on lubricants and i will be giving an overview on lubrication so many will be wondering what is the difference between lubricants and lubrications okay so we will come to that. So if you see the outline of presentation, I will give a general introduction followed by some types and functions of lubricant, properties, lubrication, greases and environmental friendly lubricants. So moving on, we all know what are lubricants, right? It is a generic term. So any material or substance used to reduce friction between surfaces Whenever there is two material interacting, there will be friction, right? So you can see here we have two material interacting. Let me go to pointer. Okay. So you can see one material here and the second material here. So whenever there is an interaction, there will be friction between those contacting junctions. So we need to reduce the friction there. So we need to introduce a substance or material that is known as lubricant. Okay. So if you see that the tribology term 
is coined in the year 1966. So this tribo means study of friction and logi means it's a science or study of science. Okay. So when we study about friction, wear and lubrication, this is known as tribology. So in this particular talk, we will be seeing only about lubrication. So as I mentioned, whenever there is interaction, whether it be uh, material interaction or surface interaction, there will be friction. Okay, as in case of humans also, when there is friction, we need a mediator there to solve the issue, right? So similarly, we need to introduce a substance to reduce the friction and wear. So there comes the application of lubricants. And the process or techniques of applying this lubricant is known as lubrication. So lubricant is a substance. Lubrication is the process which we adopt to reduce friction here. Okay. As you can see here, a body is rubbing onto an another body. Okay. So if you see microscopically or zoom into the cross section where there is interaction, we can see that there are micro contacts. Okay. Even though uh, if you see as a whole, the full body is in contact. But if you see at a particular junction and focus, you can see these contacts. These junction points are called aspirity okay whichever is protruding and touching the other surface okay so here we have a junction here we have a junction so these phenomena is due to the interaction of surfaces we need to reduce the friction here so we are using this lubricant here okay so you can see a common example is ice skating okay whenever you can't skate in a land or where there's a soil right why because you need a lubricant there so here you can see whenever there is ice skating below this paddle we will have a uh, thin layer of water so that is giving this uh, phenomena of uh, free uh, friction okay there won't be any friction there very low friction will be there so that will allow us to slide over the ice okay moving on not only there if you see in human body we have lubricants right so as you know our body itself has different types of fluids right if you see at your knee joint or hip joint, we have synovial fluid that will help in lubrication. So as you uh, grow older, you know, there can be due to wear, the fluid may get affected and eventually you may get pain in your knees or hip joints, right? So this is due to the lack of lubricant as well as wear in the joints. Similarly, you know, your eyelids, suppose your eyelid is rubbing onto your eyes million times daily you know how much time it, your eyelids will be rubbing onto the eyes just imagine if there is no lubricant present here your eyes will be full of scratches only right so there also we have a gland called a lacrimal gland that supplies the lubricant for required for the eye so it is lubricant is a generic or holistic term we can adopt to all fields so if you see the types of lubricants, so now we will focus on uh, industry specific. Okay. So if you see there are different types of lubricant, they are classified as liquid lubricant, solid lubricant, semi-solid lubricant and gaseous lubricant. Okay. So in liquid we know mostly we are using mineral oil or synthetic based or it can be vegetable based or mineral based also. Right and solid means it can be graphite molybdenum disulfate polytetrafluoroethylene these are the examples for solid lubricants and there are semi solid lubricants that means it's between liquid stage and the solid stage semi okay so those examples are greases you might be familiar or seen in when your uh, vehicle is under repair now if you see some of the bearings they will have this grease okay then we have this gaseous form of lubricant. So, for example, in two-stroke engines, we need to put oil along with the petrol. So, this is to give a atomized two-stroke oil oils for the lubrication purpose. And this in left side, what we are seeing is the lubrication types. So, this we will come to know when we uh, in the second stage of my talk. Okay. So, first phase I will talk about lubricants. Then I will talk about what are the types of lubrication. Okay. So if you see the major functions of lubrication is to reduce friction, uh, protection that is to prevent wear and sometimes to provide cooling effect that is to carry away the heat generated in the interface to reduce corrosion, cleaning action by the detergency effect, noise dampening or noise pollution reduction using the fluid, 
it can be preventing leakage it can be to improve efficiency and increase the service life of the product so pre, uh, if you narrow down we have lubricants basically classified into oils greases solid lubricants and gases so oils we have dis discussed that is having the lowest viscosity right then will come greases then will come the solid lubricants solid lubricants are used where we can't use oils or greases right they are uh, especially in the aerospace or space industries we go for solid lubricants and another advantage here is even thin layer of solid lubricants can give high amount of friction reduction okay because of their molecular structure layered molecular structure and then there are gases so here today i will be uh, mainly focusing on oils and greases okay right so we will start with the lubricating oils okay before uh, going into the synthesis or how it is being made we will just see how what are the classifications of these lubricants okay so first we will see classification of lubricants based on its functionality so first we will focus on the function so this is again familiar to you automobile lubricating oil industrial lubricating oils metal working oils industrial specialty oils and marine lubricating oils these are the main classifications so if you subdivide these things again you can see in automobile as you are well aware that they are again classified we need gear oil we need engine oil we need transmission oil we need brake oil for a shock absorber we need uh, shock absorber oil etc right so it finds application in piston area transmission area piston rings main bearings connecting rod bearings valve trains crankshaft etc so if i keep on telling now it's be used you may find it difficult where exactly transmission oil is used gear oil but i am sure uh, in one point or the other point of your life you are seeing this kind of cans right when you are uh, seeing any vehicle now they will be pouring oil from this kind of cans so please note here here it is written the name is very, again very much familiar to mobile is there castrol is there shell is there these are the leading uh, giant industries in lubricant oil preparation okay oh so here you can see there is written 5w30 and here in left it is written 0w20 and right again in for shell it is written 5w40 so if you see such things we can't identify right which oil we need to put for our machine or motor vehicle right so this is the guidelines for that okay so sae stands for society for automobile engineers so they graded these oils based on the viscosity so that is only you have seen here 0w20 means it has certain viscosity 5w30 means it has certain vis uh, viscosity okay so each lubricating oil is designated by a sa grade or number which is indicative of viscosity so how they do that is using this uh, temperature classification okay so though they do a test at minus 18 degree celsius and measure the viscosity so that you can see here and they measure again viscosity at 98 degree celsius so here sus basically stands for sebold universal second sus so that means they have a uh, for example let me take a pen here okay so they will have a funnel kind of system okay it's a small opening at the base so there they will pour the oil from the whatever uh, can they have okay so they will see for 60 ml they will put from the can and see how much time it will take to pass through the orifice and they will count in terms of seconds for example they took this oil say 5w and they have took that temperature here to minus 18 degree celsius then they will pour through this orifice and check how much seconds it will take since it's negative 18 degree celsius it will take a lot of time for the full 60 ml to empty this through this orifice so it is taking around 60000 or approximately 60000 seconds if it is sa 10w you can see the values here okay similarly as you all know if you increase the temperature the temperature the viscosity will reduce right so you can see here for sa 20 here you can see it is on the 
right side okay so you say 20 the viscosity is 45 or 58 that means in 50 or 60 seconds full oil will fall flow through the orifice here all right so similarly sa 30 40 and 50 is shown here so these are uh, uh, very much uh, useful in application purpose very specific application okay suppose in whatever automobile we have we go for multi-grade oil okay why what is multi-grade oil that means we have a combination of these uh, negative degree 18 degree celsius and 98 degree celsius we need to work this viscosity gradient in a uh, not only in lower temperature as well as in higher temperature okay so for that purpose we have to go for multi-grade oils for example si 10 w30 here okay so that means at lower temperature it will have a viscosity uh, measured in suss around between 6000 and 12000 and if you increase the temperature the viscosity will be in the grade sa w30 okay so that means it will show the viscosity here so it is a combination of 10w and sa30 so if the application requires your oil to work on different temperatures you have to use multi grade oil okay so that is explained in this two lines here so sa10 w30 oil has a viscosity of 8000 SUS a same volt universal second at 0 degree Fahrenheit and 65 SUS at 210 degree Fahrenheit okay so as I mentioned left side of W will be the temperature or the viscosity at uh, cold temperature and right side of W shown here in red is the temperature or the viscosity at hot temperature okay so if you see a can like this next time please remember this right side is the viscosity measured at higher temperature and left side is for the lower temperature so that is the basic classification so this is just showing how the fluid flow will be there in a cold condition as well as in a hot condition you may ask why you want a oil that works in both cold condition as well as hot condition so if you see an example in the depicted right side bottom so some countries may have variation of temperature maybe 10 degree celsius or below that and in summer it will go maybe 40 50 or above that even india we have places such have this uh, variation of temperature so if you have a vehicle there and you if you have to pump this oil for lubrication purpose you can you know if it is getting solidified here right and it is a cold condition and the oil is already solidified here you won't get a pumping action here right so eventually the system will fail so basically you will need a fluid or a lubricant which can work on different temperature regimes so that is why this uh, multi-grade oils are important okay so normally we will find the uh, values in left side as well as right side of this w okay suppose if that certain application doesn't go to that lower temperature okay then you need to check only the right side that is only required for example this 0 w20 is maybe using for certain application where uh, they know that during application the temperature may not fall uh, within the given regime okay all right so selection of lubrication lubricating oils this we have seen again okay so this is classification with respect to temperature so coming back so we have stopped here right we have seen the classification of lubricants based on its functionality we have seen automobile engineering sorry automobile lubricating oil industrial lubricating oils metal working oils industrial specialty oils and marine uh, lubricating oils so in automobile engineering or automobile lubricating oils we have seen these are the main classification we have taken an example and just evaluated that right now we will move on okay so what are the other lubricating oils there are metal working oils okay sometimes they are called metal working fluids they, sometimes they are called coolants sometimes they are called cutting fluids okay why cutting fluids is because this will be not only oil as such okay along with oil there will be emulsifiers there will be additives and most importantly there will be water okay so this water is added to reduce friction sorry reduce uh, heat or carry away the heat generated in the machining zone so that is the reason these are used in the manufacturing industry for machining okay and there is hot and cold rolling oils there is wire drawing oils etc and what do you mean by industrial lubricating oils means we know for manufacturing we may use cutting fluids 
but for example in a refrigerator or a uh, transformer we need to have different type of oil for example even hydraulic oil is different from a lubricating oil right so these kind of industry uh, lubricants are again classified it can be gear oil it can be spindle oil it can be machine tool path or gateway oil etc okay and again industrial specialty oils include these oils are not used for lubrication but for other functions like heat transfer heat treatment and other finishing operations like quenching carry with a heat generated right and heat transfer fluids electrical coils okay so as i mentioned for transformer no these are uh, applied to reduce the heat or carry with the heat the function is not to lubricate but carry with the heat uh, due to flux heat flux okay and rubber processed oils rust preventive oils etc now you have seen the classification and major classifications now we will see how these lubricant oils are prepared okay so it is very straightforward we need a base oil as you can see in the picture depicted here we need additives okay if we have these combinations we can get lubricant so even said uh, though it is a bit complicated if you go in detail okay so we will see so first job is to select the base oil okay so evaluation of the base oil is the first step we know uh, like humans nothing is perfect right so even every base oil have its own good qualities as well as bad qualities or advantages and disadvantages we have to evaluate the properties of the base oil first that is the first criteria so once after identifying the advantages we will move on to the disadvantages because if there are disadvantages we have to overcome that right to overcome these disadvantages what we will do like we have some issues means we will have we will find solutions for that right so similarly if there is some disadvantages we will go for suitable additives so that we can enhance whatever the issues are there or reduce the problem or if we want to increase some properties we can do that if you want to suppress some properties we can do that by addition of these additives here okay so for example we can add viscosity modifier that means if suppose uh, the viscosity is very less at uh, say room temperature okay so we need to improve the viscosity for that we have to add viscosity modifier suppose the oxidation property that means a reaction with oxygen is very fast and the oil is degrading within no time say in 2 or 3 months it is degrading then we have to add some anti oxidants so that we can uh, prolong the life of this base oil okay and then can be anti friction and anti wear additives so if you do some test we will find that there is lot of friction generated even though using this base oil and there are there is material removal okay so uh, just to remind you friction is loss of energy okay and wear is loss of material so whenever there is two material interacting we may feel that the, there is loss of energy there is loss of material that is wear so if your oil is not reducing that we may have to add these additives also like anti friction or anti wear additives so we have just seen what are the key ingredients for making a lubricant what are they one is base oil and second is additives right and additives can be as uh, discussed it can be anti oxidants anti wear agents detergents dispersants deformers four point depressants viscosity index improvers v emulsifiers extreme pressure agents rust inhibitor or corrosion inhibitor we can have emulsifier additives metal deactivator gelling agent bactericides etc okay so we'll come in detail one by one so if you see the percentage of these uh, additives or base oil we are using for preparation of this lubricating oil 70 to 90 percentage this uh, not here 70 to 95 percentage okay or lion share is for the base oil so major property of this lubricating oil depends on the base oil here okay so we have 90 to 90 or 70 to 95 percent base oil then we have this dispersion inhibitor package so this is nothing but the additives okay so this comes as a package which will have all the previously mentioned things this package means many of the uh, additives here now will be added to that so that is nothing but the da package viscosity modifier again is an additive and four point depressant also is an additive 
So if you ask me what is four point depression, for example, if you know coconut oil, if you keep at 18 degrees Celsius, it will become a cloudy, right? And it will not flow easily. So the temperature at which a fluid will or a oil will flow is known as four point. Okay. For example, coconut oil four point is 25. So if you reduce below 20 or 23, I would say between 23, 24 range. Okay. So if you reduce below that, what will happen? It will solidify. Correct. If you increase the temperature, what will happen again? It will become liquid. So the around 23, 25 coconut oil will become, uh, try to become a semi-solid state and become solid if you further reduce the temperature. So the 4.4 coconut oil is 23, 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, I told that this 90 to 95 percentage or 70 to 95 percent is base oil. Now we have to see what are these base oils. Okay. It can be natural, it can be synthetic. Natural means it is naturally occurring like animal fat, whale, fish oil, shark oils. Okay. It can be uh, vegetable oil based, it can be mineral oil or crude oil based. Right. And synthetic means it is man made. Okay. We will uh, merge more, uh, monomers and become polymers. Okay. It is synthetically made. So synthetic hydrocarbon, diesters, fluorofluorocarbon, polyglycoether, fluoroester are some of the examples of synthetic organics. Okay. Now, if you compare mineral oil based lubricants with the synthetic lubricants and vegetable oil based lubricants, as I mentioned, each has its own pros and cons or advantages as well as disadvantages. All right. So if you see mineral oil is way cheap here. Okay. But synthetic uh, lubricants, we have to manufacture from the base. Okay, it is a chemical or laboratory process. So it is expensive or costly. But vegetable oil is in between. It, it's, it is moderately cheap because it depends on availability, depends on uh, uh, how much uh, crop you have to extract a particular oil. Right. Second is non-biodegradable. That means mineral oil is non-biodegradable. So if you uh, throw this mineral oil into nature after this usage, it will be staying there and it will contaminate the earth's surface, it will harm the environment, it will eventually reach the water system and it will even uh, destroy the uh, 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 living beings in water. Okay, And even if it is thrown outside, eventually it will harm the, it is not basically environment friendly as you all know. Whereas synthetic lubricants is biodegradable and it is sustainable. Okay. Whereas vegetable oil based lubricants are also biodegradable. So in this case, if you see, this is preferred biodegradability point of view. And also if you see toxicity effect, as I mentioned, if you use this lubricant and if you don't uh, process it properly and simply drain or put in sewage, this will lead to more dangerous situations. Okay, as I mentioned, this is not environmental friendly and these oils will come in contact with water system. Eventually, it can contaminate the food we are eating through vegetables we are purchasing. Okay, because the water system is connected, right? It will eventually reach uh, the fish bodies, fish will be affected. So if you consume fish, we eventually get toxic components in our body. So if you see biodegradability and toxicity aspect, these mineral oil based lubricants are not preferred as i mentioned but it is cheap here so this is another reason why it is flourishing okay and synthetic lubricants of course it is non-toxic again vegetable oil based lubricants are also non-toxic so moving ahead so you know we are obtaining uh, this base oil either from uh, vegetable oil or mineral oil okay but we know don't know how to extract from mineral oil right we will uh, get oil in a crude form first or crude, crude, we will call this crude petroleum. Okay. Then after distillation process and vacuum distillation and further refining, we will classify this into different groups. Okay. So this is the steps to obtain different base oil. So here comes our refined base oils. Okay. So what is this group 1, group 2, group 3 and group 4? Again, may be confusing for you. We will see this table that will clear all your doubts okay so what is group one is solvent refined so this is the first refining process okay there the sulfur percentage should be uh, around point uh, greater it can be uh, greater than 0.03 percentage okay and saturates will be less than 90 percentage 
and the viscosity range or viscosity index range is between 80 to 120. Uh, sorry to uh, uh, interrupt here. This viscosity index is different from viscosity. I repeat here, this viscosity index is different from viscosity. Viscosity index means the ability of an oil to uh, keep the viscosity constant with, uh, with the change in temperature. Okay, that means if you have higher viscosity index, that means that viscosity will be more or less constant. It won't change much with temperature. And if you have a lower viscosity index, that means your viscosity is fluctuating. Okay, suppose you increase the temperature, viscosity is changing. If you reduce the temperature, viscosity is changing. So in that case, you will have a lower viscosity index. So as you can see here, higher viscosity index is always preferred. Okay, so that it means that viscosity won't change with the change in temperature. So please remember this term, okay, viscosity index. Moving on, as I was mentioning, we've seen group one. Then we have group two that is hydro treated. This is the second stage of this refined uh, base oils, okay. Here you can see the change is you will have reduction in sulfur content and you will have more saturate in that. Okay, but viscosity index will remain in the range 80 to 120 here. And further moving, we can see group 3 that is hydro crack. This, uh, uh, some process is carried out where again we have a sulfur percentage less than 0.03 and greater than 90% saturate. But not here, we have viscosity index higher than 120. That means it will have more stable viscosity at higher temperature or lower temperature. So if you vary the temperature, still the viscosity more or less remains same. So this is used for high-end applications. Okay. And we have group 4 here. They are PAO synthetic lubricants. That is, uh, as you can see here, group 4 and group 5 are synthetic. That means it is man-made in lab laboratory. Okay. Whereas these are refined. 1, 2, and 3. As you can see, it is synthesized in laboratory. It will have higher uh, properties or better properties compared to the above mentioned uh, groups. Okay. PAO stands for polyalpha olefins. Okay. So they are uh, better compared to group 1, group 2, and group 3. And what are group 5? All other base oils not included in groups 1, 2, 3, and 4 are coming under group 5. So who classified this is a next question, right? How to classify, who classified as group one, group two, group three, four and five? It is American Petroleum Institute. In short, it is abbreviated as API. Okay. It's the largest US trade association for the oil and natural gas industry. So this we have just seen. We have gas oil, we have group different classification, one, two, two plus. Again, subdivisions are there, but for, I'm not going to that details, okay. So finally, polyalpha olefins. So oh, how we go for this oil selection is one other parameter we have to see. Okay, as I mentioned, few will have good properties, few will have medium properties, few will have uh, to upgrade, right? So we need to see the physical properties, we need to see the chemical properties, we need to see the lubrication properties, we have to see the environmental friendliness. Nowadays, no, this is given prime importance environment friendliness because eventually the if the earth is getting contaminated with these lubricants it is not sustainable for the future generation or even to our generation right so this is paramount importance now given to these lubricating oils okay again uh, another aspect of course to be considered is the cost it should be uh, inexpensive right to manufacture how will you identify the usage is upon application? For example, uh, again, with respect to temperature and pressure uh, distribution in the application areas, we have to see which all lubricants we have to choose. For example, in metalworking area, that is manufacturing industry, whenever there is a tool and workpiece interaction, the temperature can go to 300, 400, okay, even above that depending upon material. So here we will use something that is oil plus water plus emulsifier so that we have to carry away the heat also and we see we have to see whether it is an automobile industry or not if it is an automobile industry we don't need to add water to that because there our purpose is to only lubricate not carry away the heat okay the lubricant itself will play the role of heat removal we don't need water to add it here here the temperature demands water to be added for a working fluid 
and there is space applications of course uh, in refrigeration and other areas so we will see some of the basic structure and we will see what are the properties in general okay so here you can see a uh, basic structure of a vegetable oil okay here we have glycerol molecule and we have fatty acids so when we have a combination of triglyceride that is three glycerol and three uh, connected fatty acid chains this is known as triglyceride chain or vegetable oil structure so this is how the vegetable oil uh, structure look like okay so why we have seen here right the vegetable oil is having higher lubricity okay i have i think i have not mentioned here maybe in the coming slides it is there okay if you compare with mineral oil vegetable oil is having superior lubricity or this is better lubricant than mineral oil okay why this is because of this fatty acids so as i mentioned it is having fatty acid chains at the end of this chain we have carboxylic group present maybe uh, if you recall uh, if your chem basic chemistry these carboxylic groups uh, will find form at the end of fatty acid this will help in uh, attracting to the metal surface and thereby reducing friction so the carboxylic group in the vegetable oils provides good lubricity to the so this carboxylic groups give a polar nature to vegetable oils and this vegetable oil if there is a metal surface okay and if you pour in this uh, oil now it will get started sticking to the surface this is to the polar nature of the carboxylic group present in the lubricant or oil okay so thereby it will protect the surface from corrosion or any further damage okay and it will uh, even if there is a surface coming in contact a rubbing action is there right so this will be reducing the friction here so this will be better if you drag this surface one on two we will have a lower friction suppose you put a mineral oil that may not give that much lubricity so why because vegetable oil is having this carboxylic group present in their chain okay so these are some of the fatty acids that we can see in the vegetable oil okay this caprylic lauric acid stearic acid oleic acid so i am just mentioning no need to uh, i'm not going detail but uh, this stearic acid oleic acid these are the major ones that gives the lubricity property for a vegetable oil okay and it is also mentioned the molecular formula as well as the whether it is saturated or non saturated okay the more saturated it is it is better but the problem is it will affect the pore point of the lubricant okay so nothing 100% also is good so if it is 100% saturated we can't have a flowability of lubricant so we need 80 to 90% saturated fatty acids and few free fatty acids okay now we have just seen vegetable oil now our second consideration is about mineral oil right so we have seen uh, vegetable oil and its classification now we'll see the mineral oil we have seen how it is derived uh, distillation and all there again classifications are there okay the mineral oil based lubricants are produced by refining the crude oil that we have seen already the crude oils are long chain hydrocarbons which can be classified as follows okay so these are the classifications for mineral oil based lubricants that can be alkanes that is basically paraffin naphthen and aromatic okay major classifications are paraffin based naphthen based and aromatic based so these alkanes and paraffin they are saturated linear branch hydrocarbons you can see it is linear okay and it is mostly saturated saturated means there won't be having any double bond everything is connected via single bond here okay so if it, there are unsaturated bonds present then we call this as alkenes or olefins okay and naphthenes are saturated cyclic structure you can see here okay when there are there is a cyclic structure like this we call this as uh, naphthene okay and whenever there is a double bond present and if you have a six membered benzene ring then we call this as aromatic aroma means smell okay so basically this aromatic hydrocarbons or oil will have more uh, smell compared to uh, paraffin or naphthene based oils okay so again i am not going to this classification because this is again in detail why what is the difference between alkanes and alicyclic and all okay basically they will have difference in their viscosity density etc 
okay so in short uh, this is the comparison between different base oils mineral based base oils okay how the structure will look how uh, how the properties will vary how the pore point will vary how the oxidation stability will vary how the solubility will vary and how the toxicity will be varying okay for example aromatic even though it is having good properties uh, in oxidation that means it will stay longer okay it will have a longer shelf life it is having very high toxicity that means if any if it is uh, stable at higher temperature it can sustain for longer duration it is not environment friendly right so if you are using such oils finally it will contaminate the earth surface and it is highly toxic so it is not preferred to go for aromatic uh, base oil okay so that is why in industry people go for either paraffin or uh, naphthene based base oils okay now this again i am skipping because we have seen the different groups here right these groups 1 2 3 and 4 5 so this is a classification of what are the uh, usage okay in marine and diesel engines we in hydraulic oils you we go for this group 1 okay the first remains state of base oil okay then in group 2 it is passenger car and commercial engine oils etc natural gas engine oils automatic transmission fluids turbine oils and automotive gear oils etc and group 3 is premium passenger car motors okay where you can see uh, you need better oil there automatic transmission or fluids food grade lubricants white oil uh, quality lubricants etc and group 4 as i mentioned they are poly alpha olefins or synthetic or man made uh, devoid of any impurities okay they are excellent performance at high temperatures with a superior oxidation stability so these are high end lubricants or lubricating base oils okay that is the reason they are used in speed uh, this racing cars high performance engines gear com compressor hydraulic and uh, circulating oils high performance greases heavy duty transmissions industrial bearing lubricants etc and group 5 again they are synthetics okay so they are depending upon the synthetic used it can be in aviation aerospace industry it can be fire resistant hydraulic oils heat transfer oils brake fluids high temperature gear oils refrigeration and compressor oils chain oils etc okay so these are the major classification so as you know now uh, in automobile sector we are moving to the ev vehicle segment right most of the people we uh, most of the places now electric vehicles are coming in picture right so maybe in future maybe in any way not 2030 if beyond that it will reduce the usage of this mineral oil based lubricants for automobile application especially will reduce but this is the current uh, picture projected okay so if you see here uh, paraffin group 1 group 2 and naphthalene and synthetic uh, lubricants are projected here how the usage will be varying okay now as i mentioned we have seen the base oil now we have to study its properties correct then only we can use for different applications so the main physical chemical properties of lubricants are first thing is viscosity second is viscosity index then comes acid value and base value then iodine value saponification value thermal properties tribological properties oxidation stability corrosion stability foaming deemulsibility etc so we'll see one by one in detail okay so what is viscosity that is a general term right we know viscosity is defined as the internal resistance offered by a fluid to change its shape or its relative positions okay so it hydrodynamic or fluid film lubrication load carrying capacity depend on the viscosity of the lubricant so this will come when we deal about lubrication okay different types of lubricant so this viscosity how to Uh, main functions include fluid film forming capability and increased friction and heat generation okay so this we will see when we study about the lubrication so basically it shows how the lubricant will flow in uh, either through gravity or through the shearing action okay so if you are measuring through gravity this is known as kinematic viscosity for example if you see water water will have a free flowing nature right it is i 1 cm poise dynamic viscosity whereas for a honey we will have around 50 or 20 uh, above 20 centipoise value here okay so what we do is we will measure the 
viscosity of this lubricant okay and check whether the kinematic viscosity and dynamic viscosity are within our uh, need for example kinematic viscosity is measured using this uh, u-shaped viscometer okay and this one is uh, another equipment this is known as viscometer okay so here we will have a shearing action so this rod with a cylinder at the end will be uh, rotating at a certain rpm okay so whatever torque we are giving here that will shear the lubricant here so that is measured in dynamic viscosity and under the action of gravity how much viscosity is there is measured using kinematic viscosity okay so this we have seen so what is viscosity index viscosity index is the change in viscosity with respect to the temperature okay so you can see here uh, i think this is better yeah so here is a liquid you can see this is one liquid this is another liquid and this is third liquid okay lubricant with oil so this lubricating oil this is a 40 degree celsius having a viscosity index here okay value here so here you can see the viscosity index for this reference oil is given as zero okay that means it is this if there is a change in temperature the viscosity will change immediately there is no constant variation in viscosity whereas for a viscosity vi 100 even if you change the temperature the viscosity variation is very less right so we have two reference oils here one is viscosity index with zero value and second oil is viscosity index with 100 value okay now we need to check another lubricant for example we have prepared a or got some new lubricant and want to measure the lubric uh, viscosity index means you have to find the viscosity first at the temperature 40 degree celsius that is u okay and what is l l is the viscosity index at lower temperature okay this value for the viscosity index zero for the first reference soil viscosity index is having zero we will get the l value and what is h h is the viscosity index value for the uh, uh, viscosity at 100 uh, sorry 40 degree celsius for the viscosity oil uh, viscosity index 100 okay so i repeat here this is the equation for finding the viscosity index for any oil for example now we have a oil here at mid dotted line okay we want to find the viscosity index for this oil so what we have to do is take this equipment for example take this uh, 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 here we will be taking kinematic viscosity okay we will take this equipment and we will pour the liquid and check at 40 degree celsius what is the viscosity index for the reference oil one say this is our reference oil one this is our reference oil two so we will get L from reference oil 1 at 40 degree Celsius. What is the viscosity index? We will put it here. Now take the second reference oil that is this one which is having viscosity index 100. We will measure the viscosity at 40 degree Celsius again. So what is the viscosity at 40 degree Celsius? That is our H value. So we will put the H value here. So we got L values which is same here and here and we got the H value. Now you measure the viscosity of our uh, whatever fluid we want to measure now which is unknown to us viscosity index so we will what we will do is we will measure the viscosity at 40 degree celsius and we will put the value u here so we now know, know the value of l u and h if you multiply with 100 you will get the viscosity index for the sample liquid of our interest so we will get the value for viscosity index for our liquid okay this is we, once you put the values here you will get the answer here okay so that is how the viscosity index is measured for unknown oils this viscosity index 0 and viscosity index 100 will be available as reference oils okay and uh, remember these are empirical uh, uh, values that means they found these by experiments what is the importance of this viscosity index you can clearly see from this picture so here this is a graph uh, with viscosity in the y-axis and uh, temperature in the x-axis right so you can see normally suppose your current fluid you are using is this one okay and suppose you are now changing to a higher viscosity index fluid okay this new line here you can see you will have a greater amount of fuel economy here compared to the previous oil you are using because of this high viscous or high viscosity index fluid you are using okay so hope this is clear we have viscosity as the resistance of motion of fluid 
and we have viscosity index is the change in viscosity with respect to temperature. For example, this SA40 at 40 degrees Celsius will have viscosity here and if you increase the temperature and measure the viscosity at 100 degrees Celsius, you will get a viscosity lower than the first one. Similarly, if you take SA10, we have viscosity here and SA10 will have a higher viscosity, a lower viscosity at higher temperature. Okay. And if you take a combination of these two, okay, if you make uh, use SA10 and 40 to make a multi-grade oil, you can have a better lubricant here. The dotted line shows SA10 W40. That means this is having higher viscosity index compared to the SA40 as well as SA10. I repeat, SA stands for Society of Automobile Engineers. These are the grading for that. Okay, so better than 40 or better than 10, it will be uh, good for the engine if you put SA 10W40 here. All right. So that is viscosity. Now second is chemical properties. Okay. Uh, one more thing. Here we have studied only about or seen only about change in uh, viscosity with respect to temperature. There are equations which shows change in viscosity with respect to pressure also. But those details we are not dealing. Major or important thing is with respect to temperature. So that we have seen already. Okay. Now moving on to the chemical properties. So the acid number or the acid value or the base value is one of the chemical properties for the lubricating oil. So the acid number indicates the amount of base content required to neutralize the lubricant. So if I put it in simple words, Acid value shows how much acidity, acidity is there in that or uh, fatty acid is present in that particular lubricant. So what you do is you will put uh, base and check how much base is getting consumed. Okay, so that is vice versa. You will find if it's a base value you want to find, you have to put the acid uh, content. Okay, so this is a measure of free fatty acid in the sample. As the acid number increases, the free fatty acid content also increases. Now you may ask me what is the use of finding this acid value. So as you can see here, this gives a measure of free fatty acids in the sample. And you should remember here, if you have more free fatty acid in the sample, that will affect the stability of the lubricant. That means it will uh, fail uh, in no time. Maybe if it is uh, more unsaturated fatty acids are there, it won't have much shelf life. So this acid value is very important for that. We have seen for vegetable oil, right? We have a glycerol part and the fatty acid side. So if fatty acid side are increasing, what will happen? We will have reduction in the stability or oxidation stability. So this is important. Okay. Yeah, we move on to iodine value. Okay. So the iodine number indicates the amount of unsaturated bonds present in the sample. Iodine value is expressed in the as the amount of iodine absorbed per gram of sample. So again, these are values which will be useful in the formulation of a lubricant. Okay. Then there is saponification value. The saponification number is the measure of alkali required to saponify all the triglycerides in the sample. Okay. So I am not going into the chemical details here. I'm just covering the major properties. Okay. So another thing, yeah, this you should know. What is flash and fire point? Okay. So the fire point of a good lubricant should be well above the operating temperature when the lubricant is supplied to a particular application. Why we need to go for a flash and fire point is because we know these oils are being used for specific application. It can be in the machining industry, it can be for the motor oil as engine oil or gear oil etc. Suppose you know uh, for a machining application the temperature may go around say 300 degree or 200 depending upon the material and the parameters. So suppose your flash or fire point is lower than that, that means if the flash or fire point is say 100 degrees Celsius, what will happen? It will catch fire during operation. Okay. So if you have a lubricating oil with lower flash and fire point and you are applying in a, uh, your application has higher temperature, then this will fail there, right? It will catch fire. So that is why we need to study how much is the flash and fire point. These flash and fire point considered reduce the risk of fire in case of lubricant leakage and provide safety on shop floor. How this is calculated is using a Cleveland open cup apparatus. 
as per ASTM standard. Okay, American Society for Testing Materials. Okay, this one is again with the uh, standards. We will have a certain procedure. We have to maintain a temperature, sorry, pressure, and we have to put pour the oil in this uh, cup-like structure. Okay, and we have to slowly heat this chamber, and we have a thermometer to measure the temperature, and we have a flame igniter here. Okay, so what basically? Let me see. Ah, this is. Uh, better to explain okay so here we have a thermostat here okay so we will pour the lubricant into this small cup here we have a uh, thermometer to measure the temperature also so this thermostat will start slowly increase the temperature so the lubricant here will get heated slowly okay this thermometer will exactly measure what is the temperature at the oil surface okay then now we have a uh, fire igniter here you can see the knob here it is like a lighter okay so we will be frequently giving a spark and checking or fire and checking whether there is a flash coming or not okay so when the temperature reaches the right flash point the, there will be a small spark or fire and it will just sub, uh, go diminish okay and that is known as flash point when you once see a flash of light or a flame, then you find the flash point. So what is that point means the temperature at which you got that first flash. And you may ask what is then fire point. Fire point is like if you get a continuous fire here, like it is not one flash and going, but it is a like sustainable fire. It will like uh, it will continue flaming for a few seconds or maybe a minute. Okay. So that shows that that is a fire point. If you reach that particular point, it will continue uh, catching fire. Okay. Flash point is just before that. It is about to get ignited. Okay. All right. So yeah. So moving to the other thermal properties, that is pore point. So we have discussed flash and fire point. We have seen acid value, base value. Now viscosity also we have seen. Now now is the pore point as you uh, clearly understand from the word pore point the pore point is another thermal property of lubricant to assess the fluidity of lubricant at low temperature as i mentioned for coconut oil right the pore point of coconut oil is around 23 25 degrees celsius because at that temperature it will have a cloudy appearance and if you reduce the temperature further it will get solidified if you get if you increase the temperature it will become a liquid all right so again this is according to standard ASTM 97 how we test the uh, four point for a lubricant these all are with respect to standard okay for example here there is a specific pressure to be maintained okay so for example if you are doing this test in uh, hilly areas you may get a different value here if you go in a low terrain or lower altitude you'll get a different flame and sorry flash and fire point so that is the reason we have to do everything with respect to standard procedure operating procedure if you want to keep it in a certain room with controlled temperature you have to do it to find this value you can't randomly take it to any place and do it the condition has to be maintained whatever humidity is mentioned as per the standard whatever the pressure atmospheric pressure according to the standard then only you are supposed to do this experiment okay Similarly, these instructions are given in the standard, okay. So here we can see we have a bath here, okay. So uh, it is a ice bath. So here we have this tube for collecting our lubricant. So we have a lubricant here. Along with that, we have inserted a thermometer to measure the temperature. So what we are doing here is, so this is the jacket, okay, outside. So our the oil of our interest is filled in the tube and placed in the jacket so we have placed it in the jacket now we have to reduce the temperature by one degree celsius falling temperature slowly so after one degree falling temperature of course you can measure using this thermometer right once you see a drop in temperature what you have to do take it out and see whether there is a cloudy appearance or not okay if it is visibly liquid then you have to go further down reduce one degree celsius and keep going down okay the temperature at which sample oil reveals a distinct cloudiness okay in the two pass no, should be noted and this is the cloud point so once you uh, reduce the temperature further there will be a point where there will be a transition from liquid to solid so that it is not like uh, in a moment it will change you will find initially a cloudy appearance so that is known as the cloud point okay 
once you find the cloud point you know maybe next if you reduce one more degree celsius you will find the core point okay the temperature or the particular temperature at which the oil ceases the flow and the temperature was noted as the core point so you can see here suppose you took this uh, tube here okay now you have placed it here now this became solid okay now this has been solid and you can see your thermometer also is bulb is also in position and now this fluid can't pass through this tube so that means now we have found the four point value for this uh, lubricant all right now we have seen uh, we have to see the uh, temperature variation okay with the temperature how the phase change will happen how the oil will behave for that we have differential scanning calorimetry or dsc we call this okay so dsc is an efficient method for investing crystallization temperature so we know that this if you increase the temperature at a point it will become crystalline okay that we can check with this dsc or differential scanning calorimetry so basically it functions on two cans two aluminum pans are there on top of that one is a reference pan okay and one will have our fluid of interest or a sample will be kept in a platinum crucible and we will heat this chamber okay according to our uh, need or application purpose and we will see the heat flow versus temperature graph and see when the melting take place when there is a glass transition when there is crystallization taking place and cross linking all these values we can get from the uh, machine here again tg or thermograph uh, 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 gravimetric analysis is another technique to see the variation of the fluid uh, uh, in tem higher temperature whether it is stable at higher temperature or not or whether it is degrading at higher temperature so these things we can find it using tga and dsc machines okay so here also we have a balance only thing is we can have purge gas here we can induce whatever gas of our interest here and see how it functions in the chamber and how it will affect the oil of our interest okay so here they have studied sunflower oil uh, coconut oil and rice bran oil okay how this varies with increase in temperature there is a percentage of mass difference after say 300 degrees celsius for all the oils which are is degrading faster may not be our interest which is better may will be our concern for example sunflower is better than coconut oil in this case okay moving on so once you find the thermal chemical properties finally this lubricant has to be evaluated for its friction property right it has to reduce friction and it has to reduce wear for that we have equipment called four volt tester okay so it means we have three balls uh, at bottom and one ball rubbing on to that on the top this will be connected via a spindle okay so this will be rotating at say a certain rpm and this will be in contact so these three balls will be in a cup like structure at bottom so when it is this ball is rubbing on touching the surface right we will see measure friction and wear with the attachments on this machine this you can't see in this particular figure this is inside this one okay so this is this right side you can see the loading mechanism how much load for contact it will be acted upon by load okay between these two surfaces now this will give friction as well as uh, wear data depending upon the lvdt and the load cell connected to it okay and here you can see a pin on disc uh, test rib so the pin will be there touching on to a disc okay so here you will place the lubricant here in between and the disc will be rotated for example sorry for this i'm drawing with mouse so it may not be that clear so if you see the bottom portion is the disc okay so we have a pin here rubbing onto the disc so if you pour a lubricant here and you rotate this disc you will see how much friction is getting reduced so the pin material and the disc material depends on again application it can be aluminum rubbing on steel or maybe uh, titanium rubbing on aluminum okay depending upon application area so here you will change the lubricant and see which lubricant is giving reduced friction and wear another property is oxidative stability this is very much important as i mentioned if more saturated fatty acids are present in a lubricating oil it will uh, last longer or it will not degrade faster so oxidation is a chemical reaction that occurs when the lubricant combines with oxygen so this test trick will give a 
artificial situation okay or what you call man made situation of providing excess oxygen and see how long this can it's like a fast aging purpose okay we will see how long this oil will retain its property before degrading so this is again with respect to standard protecting pressure vessel tester okay and this is again uh, laboratory methods for testing the oxidation stability so we will purge in different gases and we will try to artificially age this lubricant and see how long it will sustain uh, before degrading so this is another test so this what we call this as spot oil oxidation test so this is according to the american oil chemist society okay so the accelerated aging was simulated by storing the samples in a dark oven at 100 degrees celsius because suppose the application is only around 40 degrees celsius or 50 degrees celsius to accelerate the process the oil will be kept at a 100 degrees celsius in oven and we are just uh, speeding up the process okay so that we will see whether it is sustainable or it is uh, stable at the higher temperature and these samples are tested for approximately 96 hours according to this american oil chemist society standards okay what they do measure here is the viscosity of the samples before and after the test will be evaluated okay then there is corrosion test as i mentioned we have to do the uh, corrosion test for this lubricant oil so one such test is called copper strip corrosion test so we have a chamber like this we will fill in with the oil and these are the copper strip corrosion tester so these will be inserted for a given duration okay at the given temperature and we will see whether there is a color change for the copper tubes here okay or copper strips here and then we will match with the standard uh, uh, color uh, coded graphs here and see how much is the uh, corrosion happened with respect to our copper tube okay or copper strip another way of measuring corrosion is the cast iron chip test suppose if your lubricant is having water as well as uh, some emulsifier you can go for this cast iron chip test okay here you have a petri dish i am talking about the bottom right picture okay so you have a petri dish here on that we will be keeping a filter paper on top of that we will keep the cast iron chips so these cast iron chips again are manuf uh, produced with respect to standard only okay simply you can't put chips here you have to have a specific dimension so that you will get after putting through some mesh okay like you filter sand no through a mesh similarly you have to filter out these size uh, cast iron chips for this particular experiment for example if you are taking four five milligram of or four milligram of this cast iron chips you have to pour in five ml of our lubricant okay so again that is with respect to standard basically what you are doing here is you have your petri dish you have your filter paper on top of that you are putting four grams of these cast iron chips then you will pour 5 ml of this lubricant of your interest okay now you know you will keep it for say 90, 24 hours then after 24 hours you will clean this one and see uh, whether there is any stain marks on this petri paper uh, sorry this filter paper if there is a stain mark that indicates there is corrosion okay and one more way of finding is you know the weight of the cast iron chips before testing right it was 4 grams suppose if there was corrosion what will happen these chips will get degraded right so there will be a loss in weight so you will dry this and you will again weight once you weight whatever difference is there from the 4 gram that shows that there is some corrosion so this is standard procedure for measuring corrosion qualitatively also you can see by seeing the stain mark on the filter paper quantitatively you can see or measure from the weight loss here okay these are the corrosion uh, test samples i am just skipping that forming you know that is uh, what you call the how much bubbles forms no it is not good for lubricant if you more bubbles are forming in a, uh, during operation right for that we will artificially create a situation where we will purge in or put uh, gas through these uh, tubes and we will uh, see how much bubble is Uh, getting form uh, with respect to this standard okay again these are with respect to different conditions the temperature should be maintained and we have to measure how much height the form has begun so that is the measure of forming so then there is biodegradability and toxicity so again we have different set of standards for measuring biodegradability 
that is one is biological oxygen demand chemical oxygen demand and there is uh, gravimetric gcms gas chromatic uh, chromatography mass spectroscopy techniques for measuring the biodegradability and toxicity usually is measured using uh, fish embryos or fishes basically they will be treated with the zebra fish uh, you are all aware of aquarium right so we will have different set of aquarium okay in that aquarium according to the standard fishes will be kept okay again after testing only okay in the sense this lubricant say for this first aquarium maybe 5 percentage or 1 percentage uh, lubricant is added second will be having some 10 to 10 percentage and see whether the fishes can survive in that environment if fishes are getting survived then we will find at what concentration 50 percentage of the fishes are dying so that is known as lc 50 or lethal concentration 50 so these are some of the techniques to find whether the lubricant is toxic toxic or not uh, i am not even going to the further details because it will consume more time okay so next we will see the additives different additives we are using we have just seen the different properties required for a lubricant oil now there are different additives antioxidant viscosity modifier corrosion inhibitor suppose we during the corrosion test we found that there is a lot of corrosion happening then now we have to add some additive here to improve or to suppress the corrosion that are those are called as corrosion inhibitor okay and suppose during your four point test here you did your four point test right so there you found that the four point is very less say for at least at 20 degrees celsius you are uh, getting uh, your lubricant is getting solidified but your operating condition is say 15 degrees celsius so you have to further reduce the four point for those things what we can do is we can go for these additives so you add a four point depressant and reduce the four point there okay similarly anti wear additives are there emulsifiers etc are there now these are how the packages will come most of the industries buy this additive package and they will mix with the base oil stock they have okay they won't do much research here they will just bring or buy the package here because already research has been done so they will combine with the base stock with the additive package so i am skipping skipping those things so these are different additives i am again skipping because all these are theory antioxidants viscosity modifiers these are the examples of these additives okay for example antioxidants reduce the formation of oxidation products commonly used antioxidants include direct uh, amines phenols and organic sulfates okay similarly we have anti wear additives one thing you have to remember is isddp is a magic ingredient okay that is zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate so this is one additive which is ruling the additive industry so if this is present it will reduce the friction it will reduce the wear everything but the problem is it is having phosphorus as well as sulfur so it is not much environment friendly so the research is being carried out from decades to find a replacement for this isddp okay till now we couldn't find a better replacement for isddp even though this is toxic and uh, not biodegradable still people are using this isddp only because it is still a magic material because uh, it is significantly reducing friction as well as wear so you can find it in most of the duplicates this will be there now uh, different uh, european unions as well as different countries strictly uh, control or told to reduce the percentage of usage of isddp due to this environmental effect okay and there are extreme pressure additives detergents and dispersants okay extreme pressure additives are used when you have higher pressure of ap applications you have to withstand that so that is why extreme pressure is used and there are detergents and dispersants for example there will be uh, dirt present in sometimes uh, oil or even during application some dirt is coming this detergents and dispersants in present in the lubricating oil which will catch hold of this dirt and it will form sludge and will uh, sediment at the bottom okay so that is why detergents are used in the additive section and another key ingredient is emulsifier so you may studied in your undergrad about emulsifier or surfactant right so emulsifier or surfactant is like a uh, having a hydrophilic head and lipophilic tail that means water loving head and oil loving tail 
So if you want to mix oil and water, this ingredient has to be put, that is emulsifier. Otherwise, you know, you can't mix oil and water, right? To mix oil and water, we have to use this emulsifier. How this does is, this emulsifier head will catch hold on water side or hydrophilic side and tail will catch hold on the lipophilic or the oil side. So you can mix oil and water by adding emulsifier in the appropriate percentage. So that is only mentioned here. These are some of the examples, sodium, petroleum, sulfonate. Some of the organic emulsifiers include uh, cocoa, amido, uh, propyl emulsifiers. Okay. These are some of the oil additives. Now, these are the standards. You can see these are all now obsolete because with results they found that it is not so uh, fuel efficient or giving much economy. So that is why now uh, the current usage of additives are in this classification. Okay. Right. So I'll skip again this also. So this is the comparison. Okay. You can see the primitive or STSS where the uh, initial graded oils. Now we have SN which is having uh, sludge reduction, we have better oxidation reduction, anterior performance, corrosion protection, foam prevention, oil consumption, phosphorus content you can see it is getting reduced. Okay. So these are the uh, areas people will focus while designing a lubricant oil. It should be soot thickening, it should be having reduced wear, uh, sludge formation, piston deposit should be minimum, oxidative thickening, fuel economy should be max maximum, okay. So that was from the lubrication, especially lubricating oil perspective. Now we have to move on to lubrication. Okay, now 11.30. Sir, should we take a break or shall I continue? Hello, am I audible? Hello. Hello, Professor, am I audible? Hello sir, hello. Hello, sir. Uh, is it is it over, sir? Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, sir. Second okay. session, sir. Should we shall we have a break or cut? Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, uh, your uh, lecture is over, or uh, you want to continue? Yeah, yeah, I want to continue. So, if there is time, I will continue, sir. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, so how much time I have, sir? More? What, sir? How, how much time do we have more, sir? How much time so that I can plan according to that? Yeah. Now, 11.30, there is a uh, there is lunch period. Okay. okay. Huh. From 11.30. Okay, okay. So they are going for lunch now, sir? Or... What, sir? Are they going for lunch now or should I continue? That's my doubt. Now we can stop, sir. Again, there is a another lecture at 12.15. 12, 12, okay, okay, then fine. Okay, fine, sir. Okay. Okay, okay, okay sir. Okay, sir. Okay, okay thank Just you. Just I propose.
just i propose word of thanks on behalf okay, of thanks. mechanical okay. engineering department i thank dr suvin sir who share their experience and their knowledge to our students and it will be definitely helpful for students thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very much sir okay. thank you sir right okay.